Well, hello and welcome everybody. Dr. Matthews here. Today I want to talk to you about a better plan B because every job is only temporary. Now, stories abound about people who have worked for companies and corporations for years only to have the bottom drop out unexpectedly, leaving them well skilled for an industry that no longer exists for them. A prominent example is the newspaper industry. Once employing thousands, now it's competing with technology and instant news from almost anyone who has access to the internet. Now, although some of these newspaper businesses have thrived, many are have done so only through diligence and many others are still struggling uh, in today's economy. Now, for many people their plan was always to just retire. Uh, work until you're done, enjoy your pension, and then retire. And this was a, a laudable and notable way of life for many many years, particularly during the late 60s, 70s, and 80s. But in today's economy that's not always as realistic this over-reliance on the dream from decades ago has proven disastrous for some in fact. So on that note I, I'd like to add or recommend to you a couple of uh, pretty impressive books that I think are worth reading or listening to if you listen to the books on CD or uh, books on tape if you have one of those uh, tape recorders still. One of them is called or it's titled Who Moved My Cheese? It's an amazing way to deal with change uh, in your work and in your life. It's published uh, back in 1998 by uh, Spencer Johnson and at the end of this uh, presentation I will uh, share with you or actually uh, uh, if you go to Soldier Cup you'll find the uh, action links that coincide with this presentation so you can actually just click on those links and, and get to those resources themselves. One of the aspects of who moved my cheese was the fact that things change, time changes, and when things change and time changes, times change, uh, one has to consider changing along with those times. If not, they'll be looking for something that is absolutely no longer there. Another book that I think is worth mentioning and certainly worth reading is called Blue Ocean Strategy. It was a book, book uh, published back in 2005 uh, by uh, Chan Kim and Renee uh, Mauburn and it argues that companies can succeed by not battling competitors but also but but rather but by rather creating blue oceans in uncontested market spaces that is to say rather than continue to fish in the same place where everybody else is fishing for customers for products for revenue for resources why not look elsewhere look beyond the places that you ha have already been. One of the things that I, I liked about both of those books is that it takes a different approach and a different perspective on life in general. It doesn't suggest that you stay stagnant uh, where you are. In fact, it really encourages you to move forward, move into the next, uh, whatever the, whatever's next in your, uh, on your journey. Uh, one of the things that uh, coming back to is the fact that uh, some folks who only had a plan A, uh, they've been with the same company for years, they are well liked, they're very dependable, they've never given anybody any, any cause for any sort of disciplinary action. And so when the layoffs or the cutbacks or the right sizings do occur, they are shocked and amazed and quite unprepared uh, for the most part. So what does your plan B look like? You know, today there are very few guarantees uh, that uh, the job that you have today is going to be the job that you have for a long time. Even the military, which was once considered one of the most stable occupations that one could uh, aspire to, as well as other uh, forms of government service, uh, have been largely hit by the RIF, reduction in force. And so anybody who's familiar with the military and the government at large is familiar with the fact that at any given time, at, with the stroke of a, a congressional pen, those forces, those job positions, and those uh, uh, jobs themselves can be removed or reduced or folded into other jobs, and then this, the force would be necessarily shrunk. Not the brightest of uh, perspectives, and not necessarily something that uh, one would be looking forward to, but the the reason why I've uh, developed this uh, training isn't to give you a fluffy, warm, fluffy feeling. It's to bring you into line with what reality actually looks like. And in some cases, it's neither warm nor is it fluffy. One of the things that you should know is that then, as in now, when the unexpected happens and the unprepared 
occurs, those without the plan B, uh, they tend to scramble. Sometimes plan A gets tossed out the window very, very quickly. But without in, having any sort of a fallback uh, as to what's going to happen next, whether it's plan B or C or the rest of the alphabet, uh, those folks who have no idea will struggle and they'll scramble uh, more so than those who have taken just a few steps, just a few, uh, taken a few steps and moved just a little bit into the direction of creating a plan B. The question is, if you are now gainfully employed, do you have a plan B? If not, uh, what steps have you taken towards establishing a plan B? Right now is the best time for you to start preparing for your plan B if you haven't already. Do you have sufficient savings or investments, maybe diverse investments, uh, enough anyway to see you through whatever your employment transition might be? Uh, do you have a second, maybe even a third job that you've been working part-time? Do you plan on returning to school, maybe complete your education and obtain a degree? Uh, maybe you might see your layoff or potential layoff as an opportunity to become an entrepreneur. Certainly, it's, it's been said and, and uh, it's been validated that uh, many folks are not going to get rich, wealthy, or even self-sustained by working for somebody else. So perhaps one of the good things that might happen is for you to get laid off. Uh, an individual by the name of Pat Flynn uh, started a smart passive income blog and website, which I, again, I'll have that in the, uh, in the action links uh, on the uh, Soldier Cop site. And in his smart passive income uh, blog, which then became a, a podcast, which has been diversified into a number of other things, one of the things that he continually reminds us of is the fact that he didn't get started because it was his plan B. Initially, he didn't have a plan B. When he was laid off from his work uh, job, uh, he didn't know what he was going to do, and so he turned to a, uh, a methodology that I'll speak to in just a second uh, that seemed to have helped him, and he started making money. First, uh, a little bit at a time, but certainly wanting to change the lifestyle he was in and still maintain the flexibility to do what one of the, some of the things that were most important to him. And he's uh, cut out quite a, a nice niche for himself. I encourage you to visit the Smart Passive Income and read Pat Flynn's story. He's very open and honest and transparent about what it is that he's doing. He's helped a number, a number of other entrepreneurs uh, get started in their uh, journey towards, uh, f if not financial freedom, at least uh, passive income uh, to be added to the current income. Perhaps uh, you were thinking that if you're laid off, if your job goes away, you'll have an opportunity to then relocate, uh, maybe move in with your friends or family, if that's something that was already uh, on your mind or something that was already in one of your uh, drop dead plans, one of the last things you might want to do, it's still a an option. It's a viable option. Maybe it's not the first option, but it's still a viable option and you've got a plan. Regardless of the depth of your plan, you at least need to have a plan should your services be determined to be uh, no longer needed. So to strengthen whatever your plan is, I'm going to suggest that you do a couple of things. Assess and evaluate. Assess and evaluate. First, conduct a detailed calculation to determine how much money you think you'd need to survive for uh, one or two years. This is the assessment phase. And by survival, these are, uh, this is how much money would you need to pay the bills you have to pay, uh, pay off the debt that you have to pay off, survive uh, in, uh, by means of uh, having a, a roof over your head, having food, and if you have a family, of course, providing for your, your family. If you were to be laid off for an extended amount of time, how much money would you need to have uh, available to you, whether that's broken down uh, weekly or monthly or uh, maybe even annually? Hopefully your job hiatus wouldn't last too very long because you'd, be, you'd already be active and involved in uh, a job search. Uh, then the 
the evaluation. Estimate how much you could reasonably set aside in your current uh, primary occupation or from your current uh, paycheck. Um, how much could you reasonably set aside each pay period to reach whatever that goal might be? That plan B goal, that secondary goal, that money set aside just in case. How much could you reasonably set aside and then how long would it take you to reach that plan? All of these are methodologies or, or methods and thoughts of how you can cut back and shrink down and reduce. But just as important as cutting back uh, on spending, it's equally necessary for you to find ways to add to or increase your revenue. And so I want to go into a, a couple of things, uh, just a few ideas that I have uh, that you could take and, and of course use them to your, uh, your greatest advantage. Um, and extend what it is you're doing now to add to your existing revenue. These are some low cost or no cost suggestions on how you can, as I like to think of it, slightly increase your income. This is not some sort of get rich scheme. This is not some idea that you will be able to quit your current job and then move on full time into something else. I'm just suggesting ways for you to shore up or support the income that you already have. I would suggest that you start by conducting a, a SWOT analysis. SWOT stands for Strength, Weakness, Opportunity, and Threat. And if you want to know more about that, if you visit the Soldier Cop website, you can simply type in SWOT and it will uh, bring you to a, a very well-known uh, and well-publicized article on SWOT analysis. It's also going to be in the action link, so you can simply click on there. And then finally, you can always Google it and look it up on whatever your, or look it up through whatever your favorite uh, uh, internet uh, search engine might be. But the idea is that to identify your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and then we could get into the threats. Now we're not going in this particular presentation we're not going to uh, spend any time with the weaknesses, opportunities, or threats. I just want to talk about how you can use your weaknesses, uh, or rather use your strengths, to support what it is you're already doing. I've always been a fan of the fact that you should always play towards your strengths. Now, many others that uh, talk in the, um, the leadership field and in the uh, uh, areas where they're talking about uh, increasing um, personal productivity or professional productivity will talk about identifying the weaknesses and then strengthening your weaknesses to level them out. While that's uh, certainly a, uh, a, a method and maybe even a laudable method, one of the things I see that is this kind of a uh, an unproductive use of your time. Why not? Be why wouldn't it be better for you to simply identify your weaknesses, recognize them as a weakness, and unless there's some compelling reason for you to strengthen that weakness, just put a check mark there. This is a weakness. I understand this weakness. This is my strength, and I'll play to my strengths. I can outsource my weaknesses to somebody else or to some other venue, or if they're that important, I can figure out ways to later uh, maybe shore them up or make them a little less weak. Once you've identified some of your strengths, consider ways of leveraging these strengths. Now these are again hypothetical strengths that you might have, but they're pretty, uh, pretty reasonable. Perhaps you own or maybe you rent a residence that's located in a well-populated neighborhood. Uh, by well populated would be maybe uh, several dozen or several hundred families that are there in the neighborhood. You know who your neighbors are. It's on a, a fairly uh, accessible street. Have you considered, or maybe you should consider, hosting a monthly yard sale or maybe a garage sale or they may call it a, a swap meet or a flea market? If you host it yourself, all you're really doing is you're providing maybe the tables. Uh, you bring out a few tables. Uh, if they want to hook up particular appliances to show that they're working, then you would, of course, provide the electricity for that. But then you could charge a premium price, maybe 10 or $15 per table. And you might be thinking immediately, well, who would spend $15 to come to my place in order to sell their stuff? Well, that's how uh, the revenue gets started. Sure, they're giving you 10 or $15 up front, but that's all they're paying. They're not paying a percentage on the amount of stuff that they're going to sell. And depending on how you have the tables set out and if they have furniture or they have other large items, you could also uh, uh, upsell those types of things. But the fact is it would be at one centralized location with a lot of other folks. And in the, initially, 
people might think, hey, yeah, uh, if I have a yard sale and I have other folks who are competing with me at the yard sale, they'll be stealing my business. While that's always a possibility, um, that's usually not what happens. If you have a multifamily yard sale or a multi a group yard sale, what you have is a bigger assortment. And when you have a bigger assortment, a larger variety of things to uh, to sell or things that uh, are going to be sold, then that attracts more individuals. And those individuals who are prone to buy the things you have to sell or the things that are going to be sold would be prone to buy those things regardless of where they went. And while they're there, perhaps buy some more stuff. Again, as the host of the yard sale, you don't necessarily have to sell anything other than the tables and maybe the space that you're that you're using there or that's being used. Uh, to take that perhaps to the next level, you could engage uh, a few of the local youths to actually staple up or tack up or tape up signs notifying in the, uh, the local population of the yard sales, as well as the individuals for who, who have already rented the tables from you or who are already uh, uh, signed up to rent the tables from you, they too could uh, invest in their own forms of advertisement. That way the word gets out even further. You could use any of the local media, certainly, uh, and in many uh, uh, areas of the country, yard sales are free or, or they're uh, very, very low cost when you add them into the newspaper. And, uh, and so that makes that advertising drops that advertising cost to just about nil. And the other places, of course, that yard sales are uh, advertised are, are on Facebook. Now, mind you, the, some of those are uh, uh, very quick, uh, short-term uh, Facebook posts. But the fact is, if you're posting this out in you know a couple of weeks out in advance, and then you post it again, and you remind folks that, hey, I have a yard sale that's going on here. It's a multifamily yard sale. It'll have so many uh, of these types of items, maybe a couple of snapshots of things that are going to be sold at the yard sale if you have access to those. You can excite an interest in individuals to come visit your location in order to, uh, to uh, find things that they might need. Uh, or if those are the individuals who are looking to actually participate in the yard sale by selling, they would know to contact you and then you could sell them table space. Yard sale swap meets, miniature flea markets, a, a wonderful idea and it doesn't cost you much in, in, time, in terms of money and yet it could be a revenue maker. Imagine 10 or 15 dollars a table and you're only doing perhaps 10 tables. That's already 100 to 150 dollars in your pocket for a few hours of setup and just a few pieces of paper as far as advertisement is concerned. If you were to do that perhaps every other weekend, that's a couple of hundred dollars uh, every other weekend. And then uh, again, for you've already increased your your monthly revenue by anywhere from two to four hundred dollars. It's uh, something to think about. Perhaps another strength you might be good at is uh, creating decorative crafts from everyday items. Now these crafts you might uh, be able to uh, find uh, the the resources here locally within your within your own home things that can be repurposed or perhaps a, a neighbor's home or the attic somewhere the things that hadn't been used before you could, should consider uh, selling those items if not at a yard sale or flea market or uh, one of those types of venues perhaps on eBay or some other similar online sales enterprise if you are able to produce these uh, items in some quantity. It need not be hundreds or thousands, but perhaps uh, a few dozen, uh, and then have those on sale with a nice photo on eBay, either at the buy it now price of whatever you would think is a, a fair price and, and be able to recoup your time and effort on those things. Uh, then that's a quick, easy way of creating revenue. Now, I'm not going to go into how do you build an eBay store. If you're interested in how you can monetize using eBay, again, I, I encourage you to visit uh, Pat Flynn's um, Smart Passive Income uh, blog and or podcast because he's interviewed numerous guests who are absolutely crushing it on eBay and they're actually killing it in these online industries. Perhaps you have uh, an expert knowledge in um, music or cars or how to run particular computer programs or computers in general. Maybe you are very astute at how to um, solve math problems. Maybe a 
source of revenue for you might be to become a tutor. Uh, using these tutoring opportunities could change, uh, could turn your time into dollars. Whether it's teaching somebody how to play a particular musical instrument uh, at a, a level of competency that they'd be really uh, uh, looking forward to, or you're helping somebody uh, fix or repair or modify uh, their vehicle, or maybe you're just teaching somebody how to use particular programs on a computer, something you're familiar with because you happen to have done it, whether it's a, a word processing program or a specific commercial uh, program that you're uh, very good at, that they could become good at. Tutoring is a, a great way to uh, add revenue to your bottom line without again uh, creating or generating spending a whole lot of, of excess uh, money or time and resources you could use the same methodologies uh, um, or methods for uh, alerting the general public that you have this this um, uh, opportunity away available to them using Facebook or social media one of the other social media networks as well as uh, perhaps posting something on a, a local bulletin board in the uh, store and then of course your own personal network, uh, your friends, your family, your colleagues, uh, once they know that this is something that you're doing in order to uh, help somebody else, and that would have to be the bottom line that you're trying to help others, um, they'd be in more, many cases very happy to share your information out. Maybe it's your card or maybe it's a website that you want the folks to go to to sign up for. Uh, and again, to get more specifics and particulars on that, there are many, uh, many websites that'll that'll nail those down for you. I just want to provide you with just some overviews of some ideas of how you can use the strengths that you already have. Maybe you're good at breaking down complex concepts and explaining them to a group. Have you ever considered consulting? Consider consulting part-time. Uh, maybe putting together a workshop for uh, a particular uh, niche area. A workshop that I've done a, a number of times is leadership for law enforcement in which I go to an established area where uh, local law, law enforcement leaders who are uh, managers, mid-managers, and perhaps getting ready to take over a leadership role will come and I'll uh, speak to them for a few hours. We'll work through some, um, uh, some scenarios uh, during the workshop and they will leave with a skill set that they didn't have or an enhanced skill set that they already had simply because uh, I was able to provide them with some knowledge, some information they didn't have, uh, also credible information certainly, but it takes them to, it shortens the learning curve and takes them to the place uh, that they want to be within their professional careers. Maybe you uh, help, uh, enjoy help helping uh, non-native language speakers learn a particular language. Uh, the language I've tossed here are just Spanish, England, and perhaps even Mandarin. So if you have a uh, an English speaker, primary language who, who uh, uh, language, a person whose primary language is English, and they're trying to learn Spanish, Mandarin, or some other language other than English, and you're good at whatever the other language is, and you can uh, provide for them some, uh, some more than just consulting and more than just tutoring, uh, you can actually teach them how to speak this particular language in a manner that would be considered conversational. That's a, a wide open space for you to leverage. And there's a number of different ways you could do that, whether that's face to face or it's over uh, the internet using Skype or Zoom or one of the other um, face to face or semi face to face conference call type of of uh, programs or applications. There's a lot of different ways that you could reach out to uh, an audience, uh, particular, uh, particular audience, and teach them a language that may not be native to them. And of course, if you have non-English speakers who are looking to speak English, uh, seeking to speak it uh, in a more colloquial fashion or maybe just a more professional fashion or professional way, or maybe it's just conversational English that they're looking to to shore up uh, within their own uh, their own speaking capabilities, becoming a a teacher uh, or just teaching them uh, English as a sideline. There are uh, also, if you go online, you can go to uh, websites such as I think it's Tutor.com and a couple of others that are pre-existing and sign up for opportunities to uh, engage in 
teaching other people how to speak a particular language. And English right now is one of the uh, more, more popular languages for non-English speakers to, uh, uh, to sign up for. Perhaps you're gifted in developing phys uh, physical fitness regimes for um, uh, sedentary occ occupations. Maybe you know that sitting at your desk or sitting at the computer or sitting at a uh, uh, on the line somewhere can develop uh, or create within individuals some physical debilities that can be overcome through some specific stretching or some specific exercises uh, or some infrequent standing and stretching and a combination of exercises that can be done right there in the work workspace by being a becoming a, a fitness coach even if it's just at uh, that point that particular area for that particular niche area this is a great opportunity for you to help somebody else and then of course earn additional revenue this is a win-win uh, for just about everybody who's involved the individual gets uh, healthier and then you make revenue uh, or add to your revenue on the side maybe you enjoy writing or, or reading information and then sharing that same information well you should consider maybe uh, starting a membership blog, something along the lines of, of how you could perhaps do something like scrapbooking. That's something you might, if that's something that you enjoy or something that's uh, uh, enjoyable for you, there are plenty of other people who would love to learn how you go about doing, uh, a, making particular uh, scrapbook uh, pages or if it's some sort of craft that you again are developing or you're very good at there's uh, lots of folks that you could find an, a, a, a a waiting audience looking for an opportunity to absorb the knowledge that you're ready to provide to them and you can do that through a membership blog and again you could advance this a little bit further by uh, going online either creating a, a website or using uh, one of the uh, multimedia packages that will allow you to interact with uh, individuals online and, and again if you want to take this to another level perhaps the next level you might consider something like uh, recording those recording those videos or recording those uh, activities and then uh, selling those or even playing those back on your website uh, for the membership themselves this way you've only done the the activity maybe once or twice and those who are interested in uh, in uh, purchasing uh, those that specific video and how do you how did you paint that particular scene or how did you create that particular uh, craft object uh, they could either buy those videos from you directly or what a lot of uh, individuals do is they monetize their YouTube site by adding uh, advertising there and then they simply place these things these videos on YouTube and allow people to uh, download them at their leisure and then they recoup a, a small amount of uh, of revenue usually uh, through the YouTube advertisement again uh, the idea here isn't to give you every step of how you go through that that can be done at a later time and there's many other um, videos and resources that you can use to get you uh, the step-by-step -step procedure what I want to do is provide to you a general overview uh, one of the things I do want to, to also mention is that even though uh, these tactics can be very useful, they're not designed to replace your primary income. Uh, they can at some point replace your primary income if they become very lucrative or you uh, find that you are, as many people have done, they start out with a hobby which turns into a business and then finding find out that their hobby slash business is bringing in more income than their primary source of uh, income was perhaps then it's time to consider making a change but that might be down the road for many of you uh, I know it'll be down the road for, for many of us for many years because of uh, the just the way that things start out many of these these uh, ideas these strengths that turn into hobbies and uh, uh, businesses uh, they take a little while to get off the ground and whether a little while is a couple of days or a couple of weeks or a couple of months or maybe longer than that uh, it's probably not going to be an instant overnight uh, success but one of the things I can guarantee you is that if you apply the discipline necessary to prepare for uh, one or two years of income using these strength-based uh, methodologies you will be in a, a far better position uh, to 
to navigate and to and to weather your uh, unemployment or your employment transition uh, should that actually come you'll have the peace of mind that says hey I have other things I can do I have a a colleague who while he was preparing to retire from uh, active service with the uh, higher patrol also was interested in real estate. He was uh, only tertiarily interested in real estate, but then he got quite interested in it and went and uh, took the classes and went through the training and took the tests. And sure enough, right after he retired, he uh, went into real estate. And to uh, to uh, to his to his credit, every time I am talking to him, I ask him how is he doing. He says, "I'm as busy as I want to be." In the world of real estate, that's kind of how it is. And because he has this as a secondary uh, source of income, it's not something that he has to rely on. So he's in a good place, and he has that peace of mind. Usually, it's that same peace of mind that most of us look to find. Again, the intention here is not to make you paranoid about your job or your job prospects, but to make you more prepared. Because in truth, uh, the, unless you own your own business, you don't have a whole lot of control over your immediate future. There are some things you can do to impact your uh, future in a good way, as well as in a bad way. But then, uh, by and large, much of that is way out of your hands. It might be the whims of the economy, it might be uh, the whims of society, it might be something even beyond the uh, the economy itself, uh, some sort of world event to include some sort of natural uh, disaster that could occur. That would change whatever your primary plan is. So establishing a plan B gives you back some of the control because every job is only temporary. So there you have it. I hope that you found this presentation helpful and if you did I hope that you will feel free to share it with others but even more importantly take action today and reclaim some of the control over your future that you had. You can find more information about uh, Soldier Cop and some of the other ideas if you visit us at www.soldiercop.com. Hey thanks a lot for your time, your attention and I wish you the greatest of luck uh, in your future endeavors. Uh, keep moving forward. Have a great one.